a newborn baby is cute, but doesn't own a thing and is completely helpless. She's not as poor as you might think because, well, her grandparents have set up a, a trust fund for her, and even though she won't be able to get it, has, won't have any control over the money until she becomes an adult, she's provided for with everything she'll need. It's a little bit like our situation as newborn Christians. Unfortunately, the, the phrase born-again Christian has often been seen as fighting words, even among Christians. Sometimes saying that one has been born again is, is a claim of moral superiority, like being first-class Christians in contrast to these those other second-class Christians out there. Sometimes the phrase, you must be born again, is spoken almost like a threat. And in reaction, other Christians avoid the language entirely because they don't want to sound intolerant or fanatical. While we need to be careful about using that born-again language, it is biblical. Today, from First Peter, we hear these words. By his great mercy, God has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The biblical concept of being born again isn't a threat, but a tremendous promise. This is, this is a good text for Easter season in which we, we focus on the meaning of Jesus' resurrection. On Easter, Jesus just didn't return to the same type of life he had been living before but to a new level of living. Death had no more dominion over him, said St. Peter. And the new life, the, the born-again life that is promised to believers is possible because of Jesus' resurrection. Something completely new in the whole history of the world happened at Easter. Jesus' rising meant that all the power of sin, death, and destruction was gone. Well, not, not quite gone, but it was derived of all its power. But make no mistake, they, they can still rage and threaten and still cause a great deal of harm, but they have no final authority over the human race, over you and me. It is pretty bold language to say that sin and death have no final power over us. So let us make sure we understand why we can say something like that. Now, is it because our true selves are immortal beings who cannot be harmed by death? That is a popular New Age dream, though it's really as old as dirt. But it is not true. God alone, not human beings, has immortality. Can we claim victory over sin because we are highly moral people who can resist all kinds of temptation and keep from sinning so that we can live in complete purity? I don't think so. We may struggle against temptations, but we fall for them all too easily. We are not immortal, sinless beings, as each of us knows all too well from the inside. The reason for saying that sin and death are ultimately powerless, and the reason for being able to talk about this new life, is the resurrection of Jesus, plain and simple. Jesus died like millions of others and lay there in the hopeless dead in the common grave that the people of Israel called Sheol, the underworld. Sheol was the place from which no one returned. And God raised Jesus from the dead. 
And since Jesus lives, the realm of the dead is no longer without hope. Jesus died our death, sharing 100% in our human condition. And in turn, we are given a share of his new life. Jesus did not just rise from the dead for himself, like some action hero in a story who's, who somehow escapes death at the very last moment so there can be a sequel. Jesus too, no. He is risen for the whole of the human race so that we might be raised with him. This is what the text we have today. That's why it begins with giving thanks. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for giving us the new birth through the resurrection. I'll read it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for giving us a new birth through the resurrection. This new birth is the work of God alone by his great mercy as our, our lesson from first peter says we have been born anew the king james translation makes it even clearer by saying that god hath begotten us again unto a lively hope it is god who makes it happen just as a baby can take no credit for being born, or even claim to have helped in the process, so a Christian should give all the credit to God, lest anyone should boast for having been born again. It has nothing to do with how good we are, or what we've done to deserve life, but it is entirely entirely God's gift. Some biblical scholars think that 1 Peter comes from a baptismal setting. And it, may, it may even have parts of a sermon to the newly baptized within it. That would fit with several of the things in the letter, including the reference to baptism in the third chapter. And in several other places in the New Testament, language about being born again is linked to baptism. When Jesus explains being born anew or being born from above in the Gospel of John, he says it means being born of water and the Spirit. And baptism says very clearly that it is God who is doing something. The person who is being baptized, adult or child, is passive. He or she just stands there or, or lies there. It is by God's command and promise that baptism happens and amounts to anything. God and God alone is the one who is active, period. We make a, a big deal of birthdays. Because being born is, is pretty important. But it is not the end of the person's story. In the same way, our picture of the Christian life would be sadly incomplete if we ended with being born again at some particular moment. Baptism or a person's con conversion experience can be an emotional and memorable event. But the new life goes on from there. That event is simply the beginning. Our text immediately points from the reality of the new birth to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The new birth is the start of the new life, calling us to live out and share the life God gives to us as a gift. To say that our inheritance, our inheritance is kept in heaven means that we do not fully have it right now. 
It's like a situation in which the baby is the heir to a valuable estate that is kept in trust so that nothing can threaten it until the child reaches the proper age. Likewise, our inheritance as the children of God is kept secure in God's care. We sometimes refer to a person who's been lucky enough to born, be born with rich parents as having been born with a silver spoon in his mouth. In one sense, that's what Peter is saying about Christians. But it does not mean that those who are born again will have an easy life in the world. Several things in this letter indicate that, the, that it was sent to Christians who were experiencing harassment, harassment and persecution because of their faith. That it was written to encourage them to persevere in the faith in spite of the hardships. Even when Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire, the government authorities usually didn't seek out Christians to persecute them. A lot of the troubles that ordinary Christians had came from suspicion and hatred from their neighbors. Christians were different. They, had to re they refused to take part of of popular religious exercises, Roman Roman uh, religious exercises. And they had a moral standard that kept them from, um, from being involved in a lot of the public activities like the spectacle in the arena. And even though Christians accepted the, the emperor and the other authorities, uh, as this letter actually tells them to do, um, they put Christ and not the security of the state in first place. So their neighbors would circulate rumors and sometimes even report them to the authorities. Christian church membership in, in this country is pretty respectable, respectable, but our culture is unchristian in important ways. And if Christ is put first in your life, you may find yourself in situations in which people think you're weird or stupid or fanatical or even, even subversive. Peter says that that's to be expected and, and does not tell the Christians he writing, he's writing to or, or us how to avoid those difficulties. They are just going to happen. But he tells us that our inheritance is secure. And that the difficulties we encounter as Christians will be turned to good purpose by God. They'll be used for cleansing and purifying. So that our lives, our new lives as Christians, will be made even closer to what God intends for us to be. All the trials will be like fire used to purify a precious metal so that in the end it will be more valuable. And as we continue to trust in Christ through it all, we have the assurance of the new relationship with God that Christ won for us in his death and resurrection. In our lives as children of God, we will face hardships. We are, after all, called to take up our cross and, and follow Christ. But we are reborn with far more than a, than a silver spoon in our mouth. We are receiving the outcome of our faith as our reading ends the salvation of our souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.